All right, now before we go into the lesson, let me do a little bit of review from last time. Uh, we are going through the doctrine of Christ, and we dealt with the eternal existence of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, that Jesus Christ did not begin at His birth, but He was sent of the Father. That means He existed before. And not only was He sent, but He is eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. We also dealt with the, both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Uh, the deity uh, speaks of His perfection in His person, His nature, His humanity. Uh, he came to die for our sins, and God cannot die. And so He had to become a man so that He could die on our behalf. And in this uh, next section, we are dealing with the atonement of Christ. And um, we're going to cover the resurrection of Christ, the ascension, and the present work of Christ, and also the future work of Christ uh, that is to be done uh, later. But as I mentioned, that the salvation work of Christ is summarized in both His death and His resurrection. And so in this study on the atonement, we are focusing on His death. The doctrine of uh, biblical Christianity is distinct from all other world religions uh, combined. All world religions combined are comprehended, as I said last week, in one word, and that is do. Now, whether one is a Roman Catholic, whether one is a Mormon, uh, even a Hindu, it is all about a system of do this and this and this in order to bring about this in your life whether it be heaven or nirvana or whatever it is, it's a do system. But the message of the Bible and biblical Christianity is comprehended in one word, which is not do, but it's done, right? The work of the atonement is done, and therefore as Christians, our salvation, our hope, is not in something that we do, but it's in what Jesus Christ has done for us, uh, and accomplish in His work. Now, if you go with me in Romans, we began in Romans chapter 5, and we'll begin here again this time. And so if you open your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5. We'll read again this section in Romans 5, verse 1, down to verse 11. And here, we have a good summary of the doctrine of the atonement. So notice with me, Romans 5, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we're talking about the doctrine of the atonement. Uh, the summary of Christianity is, again, done. It's done. The work of Christ is done. Uh, salvation is secure, not based upon the performance of man, but based upon the atonement of Christ. Now, uh, we talked about the word atonement, and let me do a, a little bit of review from last week. Uh, what does the, aton the word atonement mean? What does that word mean? John? Uh, yes, uh, cover. What else? We mentioned a, a number of things. Okay, reconciled. Uh, so we think about, uh, I mentioned three words, right? There's the word exchange, restoration, and reconciliation. And so when we think about the atonement, it is this. An atonement is an exchange for the purpose of restoration in order to bring about reconciliation. And uh, when we dealt with the word, as John was mentioning, a covering, uh, when we look throughout uh, the Bible, we see other words that are used 
uh, to speak of the work of Christ. And we mentioned a few. Let me uh, review those. But remember that um, what did the atonement accomplish? What met at the cross of Calvary both the um, satisfaction and the holiness of God were satisfied. And at the same time, the love of God was fulfilled right there at the cross. Uh, we have the song that we sing beneath the cross of Jesus, which uh, puts it very uh, clearly, O oh, safe and happy shelter, or refuge tried and sweet, or trusting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. And so at the cross, that's what happened at the cross. Heaven's justice met with God's love right there at the cross. And so we have other words to explain the atonement of Christ. We talked about how the death of Christ was substitutionary. What does it mean when we say that it is a substitutionary death? What do we mean by that? Yeah, so in the place of, so a substitute, right? Just as the word says, so Christ was our substitute. He, the Bible says, became sin for us. And that by faith, we receive his righteousness, imputed righteousness, not earned righteousness, but imputed righteousness. We talked about also how the death of Christ was vicarious. What's the word vicarious mean? Very close to substitute. Yes, Ray? Yes, it, it, it's really closely aligned with substitution, but it means that it is one who stands on the behalf of another. Now, we talked about how the Roman Catholic Church calls the Pope the Vicar of Christ, and that's blasphemy, because they say that he stands in the stead of Christ. Now, that's not true, but what we do say is that the death of Christ was vicarious, is that Galatians 2, he died as us. He died in our place. So uh, we say that the death of Christ was vicarious. So it was substitutionary, it was vicarious, but also... We dealt with the word propitiation. Now, what does the word propitiation mean? Yes. Yes, yeah, the appeasement of wrath, right? The word literally means mercy seat, uh, very closely aligned to the Old Testament doctrine, right? As we look at the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled there, and so standing uh, between... Uh, right, man and the law and, and God, we find that the blood is applied and covered the sin of man. And so that was the first part, and we dealt with all of those expressions. So the reason for that is often when we study the Word of God, or even when I'm preaching or you hear somebody uh, teaching and preaching, they use those words. And so it's good sometimes to explain those words, because sometimes we just may assume that everybody knows what those words mean, and so it's important to define them. But let's continue uh, with some other words that we've, uh, we, we are aligned with the doctrine of the atonement, and that is this, that, so let me review the words that we've studied so far, is that his death was substitutionary, his death was vicarious, his death was propitiatory, and also, uh, this morning as we continue, we see that his death was redemptive. Now, the word redemptive or redeem means to purchase. It means to buy back or to offer a ransom. Um, now, an important note here, this is important, and I think it's important for us to make the distinction here, is that the ransom for us, right, is not paid to Satan, okay? The ransom for our sin was paid to the justice of God. So we're talking about, we were in the slave market of sin and Christ bought us back. We understand that the payment was not given to Satan. Uh, it was given to the justice of God, right? Because the wrath of God was poured out upon God. And so in Christ, the atonement satisfied the justice and the holiness of God. And so uh, just an important note there. And so the thought of redemption in reference to salvation is pictured based on the Old Testament in the ancient slave market, and in the same manner that the sinner is enslaved to sin, uh, Jesus Christ paid the price in full for the sinner's purchase. Uh, we are bought, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, we are bought with a price, and so we have been bought out of sin, and we are therefore no longer, according to Romans chapter 6, the servants of sin, because we have been set free by the ransom that was paid. 
Uh, now let's look at a few scripture that speak of this redemptive work. Uh, who'd like to go to Matthew 20, 28? Matthew 20, 28, John, Romans 3, 24, James, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Ray, and then Hebrews 9, 12. All right, Craig. So let's look here as we think about the idea of redemption. Uh, let's see, see what the Bible teaches about that. So Matthew 20, 28. So the Bible makes it, Jesus Christ speaks of himself and he says that the Son of Man came to be ministered, unto, uh, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life, here it is, a ransom. That means that he purchased, he would purchase, he would give the prize for those who are engulfed as slaves in the slave market of sin who are not able themselves to deliver themselves out of that. But Jesus Christ offered himself as a ransom, as a redeemer of those who were in bondage. Okay? Uh, let's go to Romans 3, verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so justification is free. It is by the grace of God through what? Through redemption. Through the purchase, through the ransom that is found in who? Christ Jesus, there it is, it says it right here. I mean, very clearly, justification, which is free, is acquired by the grace of God, uh, but the, the work that was done to accomplish that was the work of redemption, and the work of redemption is found in Christ. And so, in that order. Let's go to look at Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> Okay, so here the language is those that are under the law. So under the law, we are guilty of breaking the law, and so we are enslaved to sin. We're under the law. We're in this bondage. We cannot deliver ourselves from that bondage. But the Bible says that we are redeemed, bought back those who are, were under the law. Okay? And now that we've been bought back, understand it's not just that we're free from sin. We have been adopted. <laughs> it's not just, uh, hey, I bought you, you're free to go. Do No, no, you're adopted into the family of God. Romans 8 talks about that, that uh, we, the Spirit itself bear, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We cry because of that, Abba, Father, we are uh, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And so we are adopted. That's redemption. So not just a buying to set free to go do your own thing, but to become a child of God. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 9, 12. Craig? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood who entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay, now notice here, the picture here is, uh, again, the, the Old Testament is the blood of goats, right, was used as an appeasement to God, but here it's by his own blood, so he entered into the holy place, notice, having obtained redemption for us. And so he comes to God, Jesus Christ, as our faithful high priest, not as an earthly high priest, but as our uh, great high priest. He comes and he presents the price. What's the price? His blood. That's redemption, by which he accomplished redemption. Uh, Craig, uh, could you read verse 15 and 16 of the same chapter? All right, so we find that his death accomplished uh, this, and notice that it is for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. And so again, they're in uh, the word redemption, buying back, ransom, purchase, and so Christ, so when we say uh, we believe in the redemptive work of Christ, or the death of Christ was redemptive, it means that we are purchased. And that's why Paul, when he writes his epistle, he says, you are bought with the price, therefore glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
Uh, let's look at another word, and that is the word uh, reconciliation. So the death of Christ was a reconciliation. Through the death of Christ, man can be reconciled to God. Uh, scripture does not teach us that God is reconciled to man. Uh, rather, man is reconciled to God. God was not the one who committed the offense. Okay? Man committed the offense, and so reconciliation is not necessary for God, it is necessary for man. Uh, God did nothing wrong. And so when man sinned, uh, we know that there was a separation between God and man. Isaiah 59.2 mentions that uh, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So notice is your iniquities and your sins. Not God, uh, your iniquities, your sins. And so God, there's that separation because of sin. And so the death of Christ, what the death of Christ does is that it removes the enmity between God and man. Uh, Romans, uh, we begin in Romans 5.10, the Bible says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Notice, we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son. We were enemies. Well, how do we become reconciled to God if we're enemies? Well, the Bible tells us, by the death of His Son. Uh, and so Christ paid the price. Let's go to, let's all turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, notice here in, uh, let's begin reading in verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 down to verse 20. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.18, the Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, here it is, by what? Who? So, God, salvation is the act of God, wherewith he reconciles us, by what? By Jesus Christ. Notice, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their, trespass, their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So, the redemptive work of Christ is a work of reconciliation. Uh, there is another verse in Ephesians 2.16. It says that, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. What was slain on the cross? The enmity. That which caused the separation between God and man. Jesus Christ slayed that enmity. And so that enmity between God and man is no longer there because it's been killed. How has it been killed? In his death. His death. So um, all those words that we look throughout the Bible, and again, some of those were not directly mentioned in the Bible, but we see the language of the Bible indicates that uh, the death of Christ was substitutionary. It was vicarious. He died as us in our place. It was propitiatory. He was our mercy seed. He covers and washes our sins away. His death was redemptive. He purchased us by His blood, and His death was a reconciliation whereby He slays the enmity between God and man. Now, as we move and continue in this lesson here, I want to address this question is, what are some unscriptural views concerning the atonement of Christ? Uh, there are many throughout the centuries, if you study a little bit of uh, history, you'll find some strange views concerning Christ, his, his ministry, but also His death. But I want to deal with three of them that probably are the most prominent ones. And those are communicated in many philosophies. Uh, when sometimes if I go to a, like a Walgreens or Rite or a grocery store, sometimes they'll have a magazine rack. And every once in a while they'll have a magazine there that gets my attention and I pick it up because it says something like this, Jesus, who is He? or Life Magazine, you know. Uh, there's another one I just picked up this last week. Uh, it's called Heaven. What is it like? Who goes there? I'm thinking, this is the world producing this. I, I need to know what they say. 
Uh, and so it's amazing all the ideas that are out there. But let me deal with three of them. And that is, first of all, the death of Christ was not accidental. That's important, okay? Many of the, well, a few of the magazines that I picked up is, that's how they portray Christ, right? He was a good man, it was an accident, people didn't really get his message. I'm thinking, they, they, they know not the Bible. And so this view teaches that the death of Christ was an unforeseen event in the life of Christ. Uh, scripture is clear, however, that Jesus Christ was fully aware of his coming death and also his resurrection. Uh, this death was not accidental. Now, let's look at a few scriptures. Some of them we've already mentioned, but let's uh, think about three references that, that make that clear that his death was not accidental. Who'd like to go to Matthew 16, 21? Matthew 16, 21. John, Acts 2, 22 through 24. Claire, 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20. Ray. All right. So, uh, they'll say that Jesus Christ, you know, he, he, he tried to do some good things and he was misunderstood. You know, people say, well, he was a revolutionary. No, he was not a revolutionary. He was a savior. The first announcement about Jesus Christ by man, um, I guess we, I, I should say as an adult, was John the Baptist. Behold, this is how he was introduced to the world. John the Baptist had been said, there's coming somebody after me who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And when he saw Jesus Christ, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. All right. Now, Matthew 16, 21. Right after... They, Peter confessed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What, what does Jesus tell them right after that? <clears throat> That's what he told his disciples. I must, in other words, there's no other way. This has to be done. Go to Jerusalem, uh, suffer many things of the elders and the chief and the scribes, be killed, and be raised from the dead. Uh, by the way, that's not the only time he announced that all throughout his ministry. Remember, often he would not say it out loud, but he would say something like this, my, my hour has not yet come. Uh, even by, when they captured him, he would remind them, I was, I've been preaching and speaking in the temple, and you could not uh, put your hands on me, or arrest me, or stone me. Why? Because the time was not yet come. Uh, and it's interesting to notice because I was reading one of the magazines says that uh, Jesus was trying to evade them out, out of the Garden of Gethsemane. No, he was not trying to evade anything. He walked right up to them. Right? He is the one that left, that when he was done praying, he walked right up to them. Uh, he was not uh, hiding from anything. His hour was come. Let's look at when Peter preaches. Okay? Now remember, Peter was the one who said Jesus Christ when he said this. That's not going to happen. I'm going to make sure that's not going to happen. Now, Peter, in retrospect now, he remembers what Jesus Christ said. He preaches on the day of Pentecost. And what did he say? Acts 2, 22 through 24. So him, Jesus Christ, being, here it is, delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now you crucified him, but understand why this happened. Because he was delivered by God himself. Uh, Jesus Christ would make it clear that no one takes his life from him. He gave his life for man. It was not an accident. Let's look at one more, 1 Peter 1, verse 19 through 20. So notice, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Notice he's talking here about the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. What is he talking about? What event is he talking about? The cross. That's when Christ was offered as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so notice here, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So that's the plan of God. It is not an accident. Okay? 
Jesus Christ was not a revolutionary who just, you know, happened to die. No, no, no. It was the purpose of God. Now, the death of Christ was a predetermined event, therefore it could not be an accident. Then, there's another view that we need to address, and that is second, the death of Christ was not martyrdom. So what do you mean? He died as a martyr. Well, let's think about it for just a moment. This view contends that Jesus Christ died for a good cause as a martyr, trying to make the world a better place. In other words, there are many martyrs, by the way, you can think about, right, a, um, a Muslim who, uh, you know, uh, straps a, a bomb to himself and goes and, and you know, has a suicide. Uh, that's referred to as a martyr. Why? He died, dies for his, the cause that he thinks is, is just and right. That's a martyr. That's not what Jesus Christ did. Right? And by the way, uh, Peter would die as a martyr. For the cause he believed, the gospel of Christ. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus was not a martyr. There's a difference there. Um, I want us to turn, uh, let's see, well let's uh, turn to Matthew 26. Let's go to Matthew 26. <clears throat> when you think about a martyr, it's someone who, it's not someone who wants to die. Okay? Um, it's someone who Right, fights for a cause in his mind trying to make the world a better place to usher in something in this world and and when we think about the death of Christ when we go to Matthew 26 notice verse uh, 50 let's begin in verse 52 Matthew 26 verse 52 the Bible says then said Jesus unto him put up again thy sword into his place for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against the thieves with swords and stays for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So Jesus Christ here, uh, notice he, he, he's not, this is not a, a, a war for him. This is not something, he looks at his ministry of three years and uh, people tried before, they conspired to kill him on numerous occasions, uh, but they could not. The idea of martyrdom is, is uh, almost like whether it is someone who goes out and kills themselves or someone who runs away uh, even as a Christian and is caught and is, you know, put to death either by, drown, by drowning or by fire. Uh, that, that's a martyr, but that's not what happened to Christ. In other words, it was a, if it was martyrdom, then... You know, you leave God out and you think that that is only in the hands of man. But this was not in the hands of man. This was in the hands of God. And so, the death of Christ was not an accident. It was not martyrdom. Uh, his death, again, was what? The words we talked about. Redemption. Reconciliation. It was an atonement. All those things, that's what the death of Christ was. If we just say that it's a martyrdom, then the death of Christ becomes like the death of every single martyr that's ever died in the world. But the death of Christ is different. It's not martyrdom. Uh, thirdly, there's another one, and that is this, that the death of Christ was, is not a moral example. Okay? It's not an accident, it's not martyrdom, and it's not a moral example. Now, Origen held this view. He lived between 185 and 254 AD. So in the early centuries after the time of Christ. Uh, this would come out of Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, you have uh, men such as Origen, uh, Augustinian theology would come out of Alexandria, Egypt, all those things, uh, allegorical uh, interpretation, all came out of Alexandria, Egypt. But this idea began with Origen, at least as the early time we know, but it, it, you find it throughout the centuries after that. But this idea teaches that 
man can be reconciled to God through the betterment of his moral condition. Uh, in other words, self-improvement is the way to attain salvation. And so they say that the death of Christ, therefore, should be looked upon as an example that aspires man to better his own condition. Right? Oh, look what he did. Wow, that's amazing that he would die for what he believes in. And that should stir in us some renewed sense of morality. Uh, the philosophy basically teaches that a, a salvation through being inspired by Christ's example. Now, what it does here, it does this to Christ. It makes Christ a hero to be followed, but not a savior to be received. Uh, now, yes, Jesus Christ is our example. Okay? However, following his example does not deal with the sin problem. Okay? The death of Christ dealt with the sin problem. Now, there are many people who fit within that, that category. And by the way, out of Alexandria, Egypt, that's where arose much of the doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church, Augustinian theology, began in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, he is known as the father of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? The idea of, hey, look, Christ gave us an example. Let's try to look at his death. Let's try to better ourselves. If you would go to a, I, I went to a Catholic funeral, and this is what the priest said about the person that had died, and they say this, that so-and-so, they made themselves worthy of redemption. Okay, that's Catholic doctrine. You make yourself worthy of redemption. So they look at the cross as a way to better yourself. That's not what the cross is about. Now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. <clears throat> First Peter 2, and who'd like to read verse, let's see, verse 20, 21 through 24. Who'd like to read that section there? All right, uh, Joe, First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 21, down to verse 24. Verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God? Seeing he That's 1 Peter 2, 21. No, he's fine. Uh, for even here unto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Okay, now, should we follow his steps? The steps of Christ? Yes. Okay? But keep reading. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that, that judges righteousness. Yep. Uh, who his own self bear our sins from his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Right. How are we healed? Is it following his example? No, it's by his stripes. Uh, notice he says, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should, uh, should, uh, should live unto righteousness. So, through the redemption of Christ, we become dead to sin and we live unto righteousness. So, yes, we, follow, we want to follow the Lord's example, but that does not deal with sin. The cross deals with sin and reconciles us to God. We cannot make ourselves worthy of redemption. No one is worthy of redemption. That's the bottom line. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody can make himself worthy of redemption. So those are the three um, uh, unscriptural views concerning the atonement of Christ. So it was not an accident, it was not martyrdom, and it was not a moral example. Okay. And by the way, when Jesus, they'll say, they'll go to Scripture, they'll say, when Jesus Christ said, take up thy cross and follow me. He's not talking about his cross. Right? He says, everybody's got to suffer in their own way, but no one's going to suffer like Christ. No one's going to take the sins of other people upon themselves. No one's going to ever do that. But you take up your cross. Right? Everybody has his own cross to bear. But nobody bears the cross of Christ. Uh, so, uh, let's uh, move on here. And let's talk about... Man, just time flies by. This is... 
I, I, let's talk about the significance of the atonement. The theme, when we think about the atonement, we, we, we have to think of blood. Uh, the theme of the blood atonement is found all throughout the scriptures. The great offense, remember, of Cain is that he offered a bloodless sacrifice. It was the fruit of the earth that he offered. God did not regard his offering and was not pleased with it. That's a, a good portrayal of kind of the offense that comes with blood atonement. You know, often people don't like to want, don't want to think about that. Oh, you, uh, the Christian religion is a bloody religion. You believe in the blood of Christ. And sometimes it, 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 it conveys what they think is an offense. Well, why is it so bloody? Well, there's an important part about that. If we go to the Old Testament, let's all turn to Leviticus chapter 17. <clears throat> Leviticus 17. Uh, we could uh, spend a lot of time going through all the Old Testament and look at the pattern of the blood about the atonement being offered. Uh, by the way, that's seen very early on, even with Adam and Eve. If you remember, uh, they clothe themselves with leaves, but then Jesus Christ gave them coats of skin. Well, a skin has to be on an animal. So what does that mean? Blood was shed for their covering. Uh, same with Cain and Abel, right? Abel offered the sacrifice that God received and God was pleased with. Cain did not offer that sacrifice. He offered a sacrifice from the fr fruit of the earth, and that's not what God wanted. God wanted what? A blood atonement. Um, and so that, that pattern is seen throughout the Old Testament, but notice specifically in Leviticus 17, we would like to read there uh, verse 11 through 14. All right, James, go ahead. So Leviticus 17, verse 11 through 14. Okay, what makes the atonement for the soul? The blood. Now, now that's clear, right? There's no way really around it. The language is pretty clear. Go ahead, just skip down to verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Now, he establishes very clearly that the atonement for the soul is through the blood. That's why in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Right? Without the shedding of blood, no remission. Leviticus 17 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is the atonement for the soul of man. And so, right from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we find uh, that theme. Uh, remember, we also see it pictured in the Passover. We know when the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt uh, that we have the ten plagues, and we know that the last one, when every firstborn child would be uh, put to death, remember, the children of Israel were instructed to apply what on the doorpost? Blood. And when the blood was applied, the angel would pass over. Okay, that's why it's called the Passover. The Jews would observe the Passover from that day on. The idea of the Passover is that when God sees the blood, he passes over. And so the blood, again, is important. You see, when we think about the blood, too, it's not that the lamb was just bled the lamb died, right? So it's not just, just, hey, we need blood. No, we need blood that results in death. Uh, God's prescribed penalty for, for sin is death by the shedding of blood. In um, the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 1, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22, the Bible says here, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled by the body of his flesh through the death, 
to present you holy and unblameable and unreproved in his sight. And so he says here that uh, we, uh, he made peace, notice, through the blood of his cross. Peace. So our Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, even we not only see that all throughout the Old Testament, when Christ comes, we understand that his death, through his death and the shedding of his blood, he made peace. Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. And even Jesus Christ himself, right before his death, you know what he instituted? The Lord's Supper. What did he say? Concerning the fruit of the vine, he said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so right before his death, Jesus Christ would remind them by the fruit of the vine and says, This is my blood that is given for you for the remission of sins. So the blood is important because Jesus Christ then would institute the Lord's Supper. He would then die after three days, would rise again from the dead, and He would command them to do this until He comes. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, when Paul writes to the church of Corinth, he would say the same thing to them. He says, after the same manner, after he took the cup and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, of my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Why do we have to partake of the Lord's Supper? Why do we have the, those little cups with the fruit of the vine? Why, why do we do that? Because we remember what? The blood. Now, look, this is not what I'm trying to get you to remember. This is what Jesus wants us to remember. What? His blood. His body that was broken for sin and the blood that was shed for the remission of sin. And so, uh, that is why when we look throughout Scripture, and I'll end with this, but Romans 5, 9 and declares that we are justified by Christ's blood. Romans 3, 25 declares that we are propitiated by Christ's blood. Ephesians 1, 7 declares that we are redeemed through Christ's blood. Hebrews 9, 14 declares that we are cleansed by Christ's blood. Colossians 1.20 declares that we are reconciled by Christ's blood. Hebrews 10.29 declares that we are sanctified through Christ's blood. That's what the Bible says, by His blood. And so uh, we have to stop there, but we understand here all throughout the Old Testament, why all those sacrifices, why all of that blood? Over and over and over and over again. We'll look at next week at three things, three major things that this atonement was three things. When we think about the blood. It was complete, final, and not to be repeated again. Now we'll talk about that next week. So you have to come back next week. All right. Uh, we have to go here. It's time to go. But uh, we're uh, talking about the atonement, okay, what it means, uh, what was necessary for the atonement to be accomplished, uh, and then we'll continue that uh, next week. But let's pray, and uh, let's be thankful for the atonement of Christ.